Halloween Brat Squad, it's Belgium Kim and we've traveled all the way to Philadelphia to the Eastern State Penitentiary. Built in 1829 with an eye on criminal justice reform, the goal of this prison was rehabilitation instead of punishment. Like immigration issues and basic human rights, the whole point of our show is about social justice reform. So what better place to take you for Halloween than one of the most famous and expensive prisons of the time, now standing in ruin steeped in history and said to be haunted. By day, we're gonna take you on a tour of the penitentiary with expert tour guide Damon, who's gonna tell us all about what went on behind these walls, and he's gonna tell us all about some of the infamous inmates that lived right here, like Al Capone and Rabbi Bulber. And by night, get ready for terror behind the walls. That's right, Brad Squad. Eastern State Penitentiary is known to be one of the most haunted attractions to visit in the world. Now tonight, we have volunteered ourselves to be the first victims to go through this haunted prison. Now we have no idea what to expect, but what we do know is ghosts and ghouls might pull us in as we explore through secret passageways. Now we are terrified, and if we get out alive, we'll get a special sitting with scare expert Kenny to give us the lowdown of what we just experienced. Now, strap yourself in, Brad Squad, because it's about to get spooky. <laughs> here with veteran tour guide Damon. Damon, thank you so much for joining us. Tell me a little bit about how long you've been a tour guide here. I've been a tour guide at Eastern State for about two and a half years. And what inspired you? I think that criminal justice reform is one of the most important social issues in America today. So I think that this work is important. I'm so excited to go inside. So what are we going to be doing today? Tell us a little We're bit. We're going to go into cell block two. Mm -hmm. It's an original cell block. It opened in 1830. Uh, it was also a woman's block. So we can talk about different groups of people that were here, including women. Awesome. Let's go. I'm excited. This is cell block two. It's an original block. It opened in 1830. It's one of seven original cell blocks. Uh, the landscape of the prison changed over time. Okay. So although there were supposed to be seven blocks, today there are 15. Okay. And this is one of the original 19th century blocks. And I wanted to show you this image here to really get a sense of why Eastern State was constructed. This is a depiction of the way that prisons and jails looked before Eastern State was built. Like a bar fight? Sure, absolutely. <laughs> okay. More importantly, this was not the person's punishment. This was simply a place where folks were held before their punishment took place. So oh, if you want to wow. join me at this sign right over here, Early American punishments were public and physical. So things like branding or the pillory, which you've probably seen in movies or TV right, before. Yes. Uh, so the founders of Eastern State, which are some people you may have heard of before, like Benjamin Franklin. Right. Celebrated American physician Benjamin Rush, a bishop named William White. Mm -hmm. uh, all affluent white men, which is important. Uh, they formed an organization to try and create a new kind of American prison. It's got a super long name. Okay. It's written right there. It's called the Philadelphia Society for Alleviating the Miseries of Public Prisons. It's now called the Pennsylvania Prison Society, so okay. they shortened it down a little bit. Okay. It's the first prison reform organization in the world, mm -hmm. and their job was to create a new kind of prison, something that distanced uh, the justice system away from punishment and try to become more rehabilitative, which is really the essence of this building. Okay. Now, how did that turn out? So, mixed reviews. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but the idea was that if keeping everybody in the same room, that mm -hmm. bar fight scene that you described a moment ago, if that was the problem, mm -hmm. then the opposite of that must be the solution. And so the opposite of everyone in one room together would have been solitary confinement. Total isolation. Isolation. Okay. That is the idea that the institution is built around, is that folks do not interact with one another. They were allowed to interact with people that worked in the prison. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, they were encouraged to do so, to receive moral instruction, 
to learn a trade. Mm -hmm. um, but the idea was that they were not supposed to interact with one another. Okay, so what were some of the ways in which they isolated and ensured that these prisoners would remain isolated? Uh, so audio and acoustics are really important to this idea of isolation. Guards would wear wool socks mm -hmm. over their boots so as to not be heard. Whoa! Food was brought to prisoners uh, on carts. Those carts' wheels were wrapped in leather straps so that they didn't make noise either. So there was total sensory deprivation. Sensory deprivation, uh, although folks did have an opportunity to exercise, there are certainly people who were interviewed here in the 19th century that uh, said that the food was tolerable, that their treatment uh, was fair, okay. that it may have even been an improvement for what, from what they had experienced during an earlier time of incarceration. Mm -hmm. But then you have other accounts. Charles Dickens came to the prison in 1842. Mm -hmm. uh, he interviewed a number of people and issued a scathing indictment of solitary confinement, called it torturous, a concrete coffin. Uh, so saying that isolation of the mind is worse than a punishment onto the body. We've talked a little bit about how the revolutionaries behind this prison changed how people were imprisoned. How was that reflected in the design and structure of the building itself? I think the prison's architecture is probably one of, if not the most significant feature of the building. It operates on what's called a radial plan. Okay. It was popularized by a British architect named John Haviland. Mm -hmm. He didn't invent it, mm -hmm. but he did popularize it. If we go to the central surveillance hub, I yeah. think you'll get a really clear view of I how that works. I love that. So this is the central surveillance hub. It's the most important room in the prison. Yeah. And I think you're beginning to understand why that might have been the case. Yes. So this design is called a radial plan, okay. which means that every cell block was intended to radiate or come out of this central room. So somebody who worked here could stand where we're standing, look down every single hallway in a matter of seconds, barely having to move their body, right. and make sure that nobody was outside of their cell. It worked really good in theory. So this Very is that big castle looking structure that we walked through today. Okay. It was and continues to be the only break in the wall. Oh, so wow, it's the okay. only way in or out. Okay. And the cell blocks are numbered in the order in which they were built. So this is number one. Okay. This is number two, where you and I just were. Okay. This is cell block three, which is the prison's hospital. Mm -hmm. And then as you can see, blocks four, five, six, and seven mm -hmm. all have two floors, and they are much longer than the uh, first three. So by the time the architects got around to cell block four, mm -hmm. they already knew that there was going to be a problem with population. Tell me a bit about the immigrant history of this building. Sure. <laughs> so up here on our right hand side is America's first prison synagogue. It was built in the early 1920s. Okay. Uh, and it had to do with a very small Jewish population that was here, but enough that a place of worship was carved out for them. So this is the Jewish life exhibit at Eastern State. It explores the Jewish experience here in the prison. Mm -hmm. And you had brought up one kind of famous incarcerated person here yes. uh, named Morris Bulber, mm -hmm. also known as the rabbi. Right. He was part of a like murderous crime network that killed people for their insurance. Money. Uh, so this is Mr. Bulber's intake card. Oh my god! It included some pretty strange statistics too. Right. Whether the person's parents were alive, whether they drank alcohol, whether they used profanity. Uh, so it should be noted that Mr. Bulber uh, was an immigrant mm -hmm. from Russia mm -hmm. uh, and upon his arrival here became an important part of Jewish life in the prison uh, up until his death, uh, which unfortunately took place inside of Eastern State. Wow. All right, Damon, I think we have come up on Al Capone's cell. What is different about this cell than most of the other cells that we've seen so far? So, for one thing, uh, Eastern State as a historic site has recreated it, okay. uh, which uh, the institution doesn't normally do for other folk cells. Mm -hmm. uh, and although the cell looks really nice inside of it and it's got some unique furnishings, very swanky, uh, other cells may have had those things as well. Really? What is unique about Capone's cell is where it's located. Okay. So, you right. may notice that cell block eight is behind us. Yes. And cell block nine is in front of us. See it? But right now, we're not on a cell block. Right. So the geography of Capone's cell 
might be the most important thing about it as it does not sit on a cell block and that's unique. It may have something to do with his celebrity mm -hmm. or perhaps for his own security. Right. Does this mean that all of the inmates here lived in this kind of comfort or was this special to Al Capone? So the cell has been recreated according to some newspaper articles that were written about it at right. the time. Right. Right. So, Calling it a luxurious cell. Sure. One right. of those articles says that. The other article concludes by saying it is by no means the most luxuriously furnished cell in the prison. There are others that are more sumptuous. Uh, so other folks may have had those things uh, in addition to Mr. Capone. All right, so we've arrived at the graph. Tell me a little bit about what each side represents. So this side of the graph that we're facing at the moment shows the United States rate of incarceration over time. It goes decade by decade. Right. The bar is red for 1970 because that's around the time that Eastern State closed. Okay. And 2010 is the most recent decade, uh, so it is also red. Obviously, something happened in 1970 to make incarceration rates skyrocket. What happened? Most scholars agree that around this moment, mm -hmm. uh, an event called the War on Drugs right. is responsible for the 600% increase in prison population in the United States. So at the federal level, uh, drug-related crimes were being taken more seriously than they had been before. Mm -hmm. It was resulting in more arrests, more mm -hmm. folks going to prison and spending longer times in prison. And the state started to absorb that philosophy as well, which was passed down from the federal government. This thin side of the graph shows the United States rate of incarceration compared to every other nation on Earth. The number beside each nation is number of people in that country incarcerated per 100,000. Per 100,000. You'll notice that the United States is by far the world's leader with about 730 per 100,000. And so much higher above the second, which is Rwanda, 527. Right, so it is the world's wow. leader by a large margin. This part of the graph is segregated by countries that practice capital punishment, like the United States, okay. and countries that don't. Okay. Uh, sometimes there is an idea that countries that practice capital punishment mm -hmm. uh, might have a lower rate of incarceration than countries that don't. Right. But that's not true because the United States practices capital punishment and it has the highest rate of incarceration. This side of the graph shows the U.S. prison population by race. Oh my God. So, for example, here we see that about 39% of folks who are incarcerated in 2010 are African American. And that's a huge problem because African Americans only make up about 13% right. of the total American population. So people of color in general, mm -hmm. and African Americans in particular, mm -hmm. are disproportionately overrepresented in the prison system. What caused this great racial difference in the incarceration? Uh, scholars like Michelle Alexander have compared mass incarceration to the new Jim Crow, mm -hmm. suggesting that the numbers that we're seeing here are simply an extension of a legacy of oppression against people of color in the United States. There's been a lot of talk about policies at the southern border and how incarceration plays a part in our immigration system today. Tell me a little bit about how you feel like the privatization of the prison system has changed incarceration. So it's certainly a unique phenomenon. Uh, began in the 1980s. Uh, a lot of visitors to Eastern State are sort of charged by the idea of the privatization mm -hmm. of prisons. I feel like it's sort of a household conversation mm -hmm. at this point. Uh, it's important to note that only about 8% of folks who are incarcerated in the United States are inside of a private prison. Wow. But it has unique implications for uh, immigrants who are incarcerated uh, and undocumented people specifically because many of those detention centers are privately owned mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of folks who are incarcerated in the United States for immigrant er, immigration crimes mm -hmm. uh, are held in federal prisons which are also privatized. How do you feel like that impacts the greater immigrant and communities of color in this country? 
I'm sure that the disproportionate number of folks of color who are affected by the justice system impacts those communities in every single way. But I'm sure it has real and lasting implications uh, for not only those communities, but for the greater society. You know, scholars agree that immigrants are less likely to commit crimes than folks who were born inside of the United States. Mm -hmm. So I'm not convinced that the numbers that we speak about are an accurate representation uh, of what's happening with uh, crime in any community. What do you feel like the original founders behind Eastern State would want us to glean today? We are still living from their decisions. Right. And I don't think that those consequences are always positive ones. Right. Uh, so if anything, I think it's our job as the public to hold people accountable who make these kinds of decisions, whether they were the founders of Eastern State uh, or the people who are making decisions uh, in the 21st century about incarceration and justice and and community safety. That is a perfect segue into what this show is about, which is that everybody comes from somewhere. What is your immigration story, Damon? Oh. I am mostly Irish. Okay. <laughs> but I can tell you that uh, I think that our conversation has made me more interested and curious about my own past yeah. and legacy. So uh, thank you, and I'll continue to research my own background and my story. Thank you so much, and thank you for joining us. I of appreciate course. it. Thank you. And for now, the spookiness begins. Stick around, Brad Squad. Check it out. All right, y'all. This is Jonathan Elias in Belgium, too. Yo, we are so excited. We are about to walk in terror beyond the walls. Kim is a little afraid. <laughs> I'm not afraid. So you know what I mean? Scared. This is what I do. You feel me? I'm excited to see her reaction. <laughs> <laughs> We're walking in. I am a little nervous. I'm not going to lie. Oh, now you're nervous. Now he's nervous. <laughs> Oh, wow! Wow! Oh, 
Did we make it? We made it out alive! Did we make it? We made it. Woo! Yeah. All right, everybody, we have the man behind it all, Kenny. How are you? I hear you're, you're called a scare expert. Uh, yes, I guess you could say I am the scare expert, and yeah. I'm uh, very happy to be here with you. As you guys can see, I changed my shirt because my white shirt is drenched. Your maze, your whole attraction got me good. So tell me about how you got in with this uh, company. I'm on the senior theatrical team here for Terror Behind the Walls at Eastern State Penitentiary. I first auditioned as an actor back in 2013. I showed up and I made some weird movements. I crawled around like this weird creature and made some weird screams and snarls and I guess they liked what they saw. Um, so I acted for a couple seasons, became a manager, and now seven years later, uh, here I am. That's an amazing story. It takes a lot of mental and, and emotional and physical stamina to go through, you know, 32 show nights, up to eight hours a night, scaring thousands of people. And it takes a village to run a haunted house too. We have about 350 people uh, that are behind these walls every show night, about 225 that are in costume and makeup scaring you, which is why, you know, it was such an intense experience for you. It's just yeah. aggressive. Um, we have about 100 folks in customer service positions. But what all do you do with Terror Behind the Law? I'm part of the centralized casting team. Uh, so I'm looking for, you know, the best scare actors to, to cast into the show, seeing what all their strengths are. I help write the storyline and write the script uh, that helps develop those characters and I help consult to see what the best costume and makeup looks could be with our amazingly professional costume and makeup special effects team. How did Terror Behind the Wall come about and what was the goal? So Terror Behind the Walls first started off back in 1991. The building had been sitting uh, in a state of ruin for the last 20 years after it had closed as a real prison in 1971. And then some folks wanted to raise funds to restore it as an historic site to be able to educate the public about issues of criminal justice and issues of mass incarceration. So on Halloween night in 1991, they opened the, the gate to the public. A couple hundred people came through and uh, people shared ghost stories. In 1994, they opened Eastern State Penitentiary uh, for daytime tours. By 1997, we had our brand Terror Behind the Walls as this haunted attraction. And then we became nationally recognized starting in the mid 2000s and we've been consistently ranked as one of the, the number one haunted houses in the country for the last about 15 years. And you're a part of that. How's that feel? Being someone that's from the Philadelphia area, I always heard about Terror Behind the Walls as a kid. And to kind of grow up and, and become a part of it is it's really an honor. I work with a really incredible group of people that are all very passionate and dedicated to putting on the best possible show that we can. I'm sure the viewers you saw, I wasn't that scared, you know what I mean? Oh! Ah! <laughs> I want you to let the viewers know what can they uh, expect if they come to this attraction. So when you enter Terror Behind the Walls, uh, we have a really unique experience in that you can kind of choose how you want to be a part of the show, where you can treat it as a standard haunted house, where you're just walking through and the actors are popping out at you, but you know, not touching you or anything like that. Or you can opt in to wear a tracking device for a more intense experience. Um, and with that glow necklace, that's a mark to the, the zombies that you are willing to be grabbed and touched, pulled away, even separated from your group. And what we did differently this year is we kind of increased the interactivity. And the second people walk into the gatehouse to get their ticket scanned, you're already in the show until the second that you leave. What difference do you have from the other haunted houses? What sets us apart at Terror Behind the Walls is I think number one, our location. Uh, being in Eastern State Penitentiary, um, this is the perfect setting for a haunted house. We have these massive 30 foot, you know, gothic castle-like walls that really kind of separate you from the grid of the rest of the city. We're the largest haunted house in the country outside of a theme park. We have some, you know, extra experiences that many other haunts don't have. For example, uh, where we are right now is the Speakeasy Lounge by Al Capone Cell, where we have cabaret singers, we have tarot card readers, we have blackjack Ooh. dealers and contortionists uh, to keep you entertained and have some, you know, cocktails as well after you've enjoyed the show. We have a zombie SWAT guard dance team uh, with some amazing professional dancers that give you a really good scare while also having some a really amazing choreography. What are some of the funniest reactions you have seen? The classic one that we love to see is a scream followed by a laugh, which shows that you're having a good time. Um, but I would say my personal favorite um, is uh, what we call dropping bodies. So what happens is if you time your startle scare exactly right with your eye contact and your evil intentions and your imposing body language, that person, their knees start to give and they buckle <laughs> and they drop to the ground. So they're perfectly fine. They don't get hurt, but just for that split second, your knees just buckle and you come right back up. First of all, so. I loved how you just got into that character. <laughs> That's a really, I guess, important part about Terror Behind the Walls is being able to kind of deliver that kind of customer service, but also being able to snap into someone that's just gonna rip out your flesh and pluck out your eyeballs with a spork. 
you know. Oh my god, what happens when people get too scared? All you have to do is say, monster be good, and we will back off and we will just let you move forward. Take that tracking device, take it off your neck, and just throw it on the ground, and then the monsters can't touch you anymore. And then if you decide, you know what, I'm good, I kinda wanna go back into that, once you get in line for the next attraction, you can opt right back in. So you're always in control. I kept mine on the whole <laughs> night, so. That's a badge of honor. How much goes into preparing for this. We prepare year round for Terror Behind the Walls. That's an ongoing process and even when we're open, we're still kind of changing it so that there's something new. We have thousands of visitors that come every day. I would say as many as like up to 5,000 or so every wow. night across, you know, 32 show nights. Now, since this is all a fundraiser uh, for Eastern State Penitentiary, um, their year round budget, uh, about 65% of their operating budget comes from these 32 show nights of Terror Behind the Walls. So it's great to keep the museum up and running to educate the public about issues of criminal justice, issues of mass incarceration. You've been here for seven years now. Yes. Have you ever experienced any paranormal activities here in the prison? I was always a very firm skeptic uh, whenever I heard stories like that in any place. However, uh, with the seven years that I have been here, I have had some things happen to me that my scientific brain cannot rationalize away. There have been some times where I was in a, you know, a scary, as we call it, you know, a haunt room by myself. Um, and I know the soundtrack wasn't turned on yet. I know there's no actors or guests inside. And I heard footsteps, oh. like they were coming up to me. And I looked around and there was no one there. Um, there was times where I would see a door that, you know, it's to an actor's hallway that has no doorknob so I can see there's no one on the other side. And it's a very heavy door, swing open, slam shut oh. on its own. Um, so that's, that's what I've experienced. It's, it's given me chills. I can't really explain it away. Um, we've had a lot of paranormal experts that have come in as well. Like a lot of famous people from the Travel Channel have come through. And uh, notoriously, Cell Block 12, which is where Lockdown, our first attraction, uh, is hosted. Uh, there's been a lot of documents of paranormal activity on the second and third floors of that cell block. So there's, really? there's something going on here. So you truly believe that this place is haunted? I, I used to be a skeptic, but now I am a believer that there, there is something else lurking behind these walls besides us. It doesn't make you scared to like still be here though? I kind of had to shake it off a bit and find a way to channel it within myself so that then I feel more empowered as a monster as I'm scaring the visitors ah, and, and paying it forward in there a sense. You go. Oh, what is your immigration story? My family mainly emigrated here from Ireland and I have some family that came here from France and Spain as well in the, the early 1900s, 1910s. So it's been about 100 years that my family has been here. We went through the whole history of the prison today. Do you feel proud that you're a part of sure. some history like that that has so much to do with immigration. Since we're being more pointed with you know our prisons today exhibit and, and revamping our mission um, to be you know more overt about that mass incarceration isn't working and um, I feel really glad that I can kind of have this really unique opportunity to be a zombie in costume and makeup doing something that somehow also helps educate the public about issues of criminal justice. How long does this attraction run for? We run until November 9th, so people after Halloween still have a chance to get that Halloween spirit. I would be that person to come after <laughs> Halloween as well. Can you end us off with a little creepy Oh, sure, of course. Let's see. What I can say is, uh, a spoonful of arsenic helps the medicine go down. <laughs> That's not good. Don't don't have that spoon full. <laughs> thank you, Kenny. Thank you, <laughs> thank so, you so much. much. Grand Squad, thank you so much for joining us. We got out alive. <laughs> you got until Barely. November 9th to come check out Terror Beyond the Walls at Eastern State Penitentiary right here in Philly. So make sure to not miss this opportunity, squad. And happy Halloween! Thanks for watching. For more Bradshaw Live, like and subscribe to our YouTube channel.